quite a lot of similarities um, with David's talk earlier on, as Ben's just said. Let's see if we can get this one. That's probably the first reference um, in English literature to um, Holderness. That's from Chaucer. I won't, I'll go into that a bit later on. <laughs> <laughs> Although Tolkien's time in East Yorkshire has been examined before, it is my contention that there are reasons why previous accounts only provide a partial picture. Carpenter seems very sketchy on Tolkien's time in the area and has since been proved to have made some errors of dating. And David said the same thing about um, Staffordshire earlier on. Uh, John Garth, author of Tolkien and the Great War, undertook considerable original research when he was looking into Tolkien's period in Holderness. It wasn't the main focus of his research though, and I'm sure he won't mind uh, me saying, not here, <laughs> um, that he only spent one day on the ground visiting East Yorkshire's Tolkien locations. In contrast, Phil Matheson, who wrote Tolkien in East Yorkshire, knows Holderness really well, but he confided in me the first time I met him, that he has not read any fiction written by Tolkien. Uh, so this talk is written from the viewpoint of a reader with a deeper knowledge of Tolkien's fiction than Matheson, coupled with an attempt to follow Tolkien's actual footsteps in more detail than was possible for John Garth. Um, it's a work in progress, so it isn't meant to be the final word on the subject. Hopefully, though, it will shed a little light on Tolkien's period in Holderness. Holderness is still a forgotten, hidden, and neglected part of the country in 2015, as it was when Tolkien was stationed there almost 100 years ago. But he would have been aware of its existence before he arrived. Tolkien had studied Chaucer at both school and university, so he would have known those lines I quoted earlier on, which are the first from the Summoner's Tale in Chaucer's epic work, The Canterbury Tales. But since Chaucer's time, extensive drainage of Holderness had been undertaken so when Tolkien arrived, it was no longer quite the meshy country of Chaucer's time. Um, I was going to apologise for um, any Tolkien words I get wrong, but I'm also going to apologise to Chaucer there as well, because uh, I'm sure he pronounced it like that. Many people who have read about Tolkien's life probably have a fairly accurate image of Oxford in their minds, and Birmingham is also a well-known English city. However, images and knowledge of East Yorkshire is far less widespread it is for this reason I'm including plenty of illustrations in an attempt to give you a more accurate idea of the places Tolkien came to know. Once Tolkien was stationed in East Yorkshire, he was living for the first time in his life in an area in which an extremely high proportion of the surviving place names are Scandinavian or Anglian in origin, although as we found out earlier, um, there were some places in Staffordshire as well that had Anglian uh, names. This would have appealed to the philologist in Tolkien. Right, I'm going to try and use modern maps whenever I can, but the only map I could find, uh, an old map that had all the places I'm going to mention, was it's a Victorian map or slightly earlier, so it's quite tricky. I did highlight everything with a, with a felt tip pen, but it doesn't really come out, so I'll try and use this doofer thing to see if it'll work. Right, so locations with which Tolkien became acquainted in East Yorkshire. Uh, includes Thirtle Bridge, the army camp in which he was based. Oh, yes, so that hasn't worked. Just go back. That's it. Right, so it's this little thing here. Thirtle Bridge is, let me try and find it, there. And that's all it is. Um, just a bridge crossing a drain. There's no, there were no buildings there at all um, before the First World War. Now, Thirtle derives from the Old Norse of Thorkel which is a shortened form of Thorkatil. The first element comes from the Norse god Thor, and the second, Kettle, is from Cauldron. So it was, it was, it was Thor's Cauldron. Danthorpe, which is a few miles northwest of Roos, so that's the top left-hand corner. You might be able to guess what that, what that means. Uh, village of the Danes. And Hilston, which is even closer to Roos, means Hildoff's farm. Let's see if we can find that. It's, it's, maybe it isn't on the map. No, I can't see it. No. It's, it's right on the coast. There's a, there's a, there's a tower looking up over the, over the sea. Finally, Frodinum, 
south of Roos. So that was on here. Uh, so it's just in. Does anybody guess what that means? That means the settlement of Frodo's people. <laughs> Sorry, I mean um, <laughs> the settlement of Frodo's people. <laughs> there's, there's two Frodimans in each option, there's another one much high, high north. Of course, Tolkien originated in the, in the West Midlands, where smaller divisions of counties were referred to as hundreds. You've all probably heard of the Chiltern Hundreds, which date from the late Saxon period. However, Holderness is a division <coughs> as the Holderness is a division of East Yorkshire uh, known as a wapentake until quite late into the 19th century. And this is a town using this is a term used in several other northern counties too. It was this word Tolkien appropriated for his weapon take, which he transformed from its original meaning to refer to the mustering of armed warriors in Rohan. Just to give you a, a bit of background, you've probably um, picked this up if you were at David's talk earlier on. In 1916, Tolkien participated in the Battle of the Somme, but he contracted tre trench fever and was invalided home on the 9th of November. He was hospi hospitalised at Edgbaston, from which he travelled on occasion to Great Harewood, I've heard of that before, to see Edith. But at the end of February 1917, he was transferred to Harrogate, and after a medical examination, was sent to join the 3rd Reserve Battalion of the Lancashire Fusiliers at Thirtle Bridge, near Withensee. Tolkien actually arrived in Hornsey, which is at the top there, uh, by train from Hull on the 19th of April. Hornsey is 17 miles to the northwest of Withensee, and Tolkien seems to have spent some time initially at Hornsey Musketry Camp. Edith and her cousin Jenny Grove, having a lot of them today, took lodgings in Hornsey, presumably to be close to him. Now, the original, um, original talk lasted an, an hour, and I've been I'm cutting it down to uh, 40 minutes, so I'm going to skip through Hornsey really quickly. So that's the line he would have used to get to Hornsey. As you can see, there was no railway line linking Withensee, so he would have to go he would either travel by pony and track, but more likely go into Hull and take a train out to Wednesday. So when he would travel, most of the time he would be travelling by rail, unless he was going in between somewhere. But when he had to go back to Hull, he would always have to use the rail, the roads. I keep finding um, local reports in papers at the time absolutely shocking. So I'm just going to skip through Hornsey very quickly. Um, this is the house where. Um, Jenny Grove and Edith lodged for a month. Very bad mistake. They didn't con they didn't uh, consult anybody. So as you can see, Jenny Grove is spelled wrong, and she wasn't uh, his cousin. She was Edith's cousin. So really appalling. There's Hans and Mia. Um, some of you have probably heard of Mr. Strickland Constable, who ran the uh, Brooklands um, Hospital, and she lived in a big hall. There on the edge of Hornsimir, but um, I'll be coming to her later on. There she is. Um, this is the um, she, she kept waking up in the morning to find lots of um, British planes dumped in that Hons that Hornsimir belonged to her, and one morning there were six of those in the mere. It's very shallow, fresh water. That's another, another view of it here. So that gives you an idea of what the um, Hulderness Coast is like. Very, very flat, mainly. Um, there are bridges and everything, but they're all pretty shallow. Um, hills are very few and far between. So moving on to Roos. When Tolkien was actually transferred permanently from the Musquitty camp, 13 miles southeast to Thirtle Bridge, Edith moved out of her lodgings in Hornsey. Phil Matheson has discovered that her final letter from there was dated the 1st of June, 1917. For the next six weeks, her residence is unknown, and as there is no actual extant correspondence, the suggestion is that for this brief period, they did not need to correspond, as they were able to either live together or lived in very close proximity. This six-week mystery time immediately followed the period of June, May to June 1917, which I contend was when Edith danced for Tolkien among the cow parsley, or as he would say, the hemlocks, in Roos. 
is a, a modern map of Rus because it's easier to make things out uh, than um, the old maps. So quite densely packed, and this is dense Garth, where it's believed the dance took place around the church. Tolkien mentions Roos three times in his published letters. On the first occasion in 1955, he informed his American publishers, the kernel of the mythology, the matter of Luthien to Newville and Beren, arose from a small woodland glade filled with hemlocks or other white umbellifers near Roos on the Hovness Peninsula, to which I occasionally went when free from regimental duties while in the Humber garrison in 1918. That's a, that's a, a mistake of memory it was actually 1917. And his letter to Christopher Bretherton in 1964 and another one to his son in 1972 um, says more or less the same information, except that the one to Christopher, who he knew better, said at Roos rather than near Roos. There are a few possible candidates in the Roos area, which has been generally accepted after John Garth's identification in Tolkien and the Great War that the wooded area of Densgarth, behind the church, in Roos, at the southern end of the village, is the most likely location for Edith's dance. This is how it looks in May of uh, this year. And it, those flowers lasted from May the 10th, when they first flowered properly, but by June the 10th, they were washed out. Last year, they only, they, because we had such a warm spring, last year it was about May the 1st to June the 1st, so it, it changed. But, in Tol when Tolkien was there, it was a particularly nice spring, so it's more likely to have been in May or very, very early June. And so, unless further documentary evidence becomes available, the absolute certainty of the identification of the woodland will have to remain conjectural. But there are a few striking local landmarks which would seem to support the identification. Dead Scarth and Roos churchyard contain beech, horse chestnut, and all the other tree and plant species mentioned in the various versions of the encounter between Beren and Luthien. There's the church. Uh, that, this is just before um, May the 10th uh, this year when the um, cow parsley was just about to emerge. You can see the trees haven't come into leaf yet behind. It was a very, very late, late spring. The only exception is a mature elm tree. Beren leans on a young elm in this early surviving version of the text. But mature examples of this species were probably lost in the devastating effects of the Dutch elm disease of the 70s and 80s, also mentioned by David earlier on. However, a sapling, probably growing from a sucker of one of the original trees, may be found just south of the church car park to this day. And the continued presence of an active noisy rookery in dense garth would seem to indicate the previous presence of elms in the woodland as traditionally, this is the tree species in, in which rooks preferred to nest. And this evidence is also boasted by the nearest farm to Densgarth, which in Tolkien's time, as now, was called the Elms. About five metres away from the cow parsley in the churchyard is a railed off area. There's the, there's the cow parsley at its best. That particularly looked really good at full size this spring, so the, the beech trees are just coming into leaf there. And there's a cow passing closer. There's the railed off area. <coughs> now this, this contains a damp subterranean staircase surmounted by an escutcheon depicting the palm of a hand above three circular features containing wavy lines, I don't know if you can tell they are, they are supposed to be wavy, they're supposed to represent water. This is the heraldic device of the Sykes family, and the hand, just see, that is, believe it or not, that is a hand, I'll zoom in a bit, denotes a baronet. Of course, in Tolkien's mythology, Beren had to make the much more perilous journey down to Melko's underground fortress of Angamandi, which later became Angband, and his heraldic device, drawn by Tolkien much later, features a hand. Oh my goodness. Um, because his hand 
Claspin of Silmaril was lost to the ravening wolf Karkaroth. It is possible that the disembodied hand on the Sykes family shield may have triggered a story in which Beren lost his hand. It was all obviously swelling about in his mind at the time. A further plausible link to Tolkien's fiction is a three-trunked tree between Roos Church and the entrance in the southern exterior churchyard wall. This, I, don't, I don't know if you can tell, but that's got three um, equal trunks springing from almost the same place. Of course, about 198 years after Tolkien was there. Um, in the early surviving version of Tolkien's story, Luthien is imprisoned by her father Tinwilin, later Thingol, in Hirilorn, a mighty beech tree. So deeply cloven was her bow that it seemed as if three shafts sprang from the ground together, and they were of like size, round and straight, and their grey rind was smooth as silk, unbroken by branch or twig, for a very great height above men's heads. As John Garth remarked when I mentioned the finding of this tree, the three trunked tree is such a specific, apparently random aspect of the story that the finding of such a tree in Roos, near the genesis of the tale, is suggestive. The tree in Roos Jetchard, which would have been there in Tolkien's time, um, has some similarities to his description, including the cloven bowl, the three shafts of equal size, the grey bark, and branches above the height of men. Although now there are also some new, these are obviously very young, tiny twigs that have recently started to grow up to the bottom. The fairly smooth bark, is now partly obscured by ivy stems, so it's been roughened by the ivy stems, giving it a rough appearance. But crucially, this tree is a lime, or more poetically, a linden tree, not a beech. I would like to suggest that Tolkien got his trees well. But the, it, it is next to a beech. It is next to a beech tree, but the actual um, three trunked tree is it is a lime. Finally, on the there's the, um, another view of it. I should try to take it from different angles to try and get, give you a better idea of what the tree looks like. You can see the leaves are sort of obscuring the view there. So in winter, it would show up much better. Finally, on the southern side of Dentsgarth is a meagre, unimpressive waterway heading south out of the village. This is very hard to see in the summer month as, as it is concealed by the heavy undergrowth. Um, some trees have been felled at the front. You see, I had to scramble over the edge of, the, of a road to get there to try and take that view. I visited this area many times in the summer, but only became aware of its existence during a winter visit because it, it was easier to see. In Tolkien's forest of Neldoroth, in which the tree Hirulan grows, is a river called Esgaldwin. By no stretch of the imagination could the tiny roof's beck be classified as a river. But the hidden aspect of the beck may have more significance. Bruce Beck, uh, I've been told by I've got a customer on my um, classes who uh, lives in Bruce, and he says uh, at the northern edge of Bruce, um, Bruce Beck is visible. Um, I did go looking myself, but I, I couldn't actually see it. Uh, and it then emerges again south of the church. But for much of the co of, of its course, it is hidden, and it was only recently. In the, and was up until recently rather than neglected as it passed through the bottom of residence gardens as it headed towards the church. It was only after torrential downpours in late June 2007 that the hidden roost beck caused severe flooding and was cleaned out and the course repaired. In Tolkien's tale, the tiny hidden stream was transformed into, this far, into the far more majestic river Esgaldwin. The Esgal element in Esgaldwin means screen or hiding and Esgaldwin is actually translated as River Under Vale. So, as unlikely as it sounds, Bruce Beck may be the original inspiration for the much more magical River Esgaldwin. So far, no convincing location has been put forward for the precise location where the Tolkien's lived during the six week gap between Edith living in Hornsey and Withensea. The clues are very slim. But in a reworked version of an old poem, now retitled The Horns of Ulmo, Tolkien added that it was rewritten in a lonely house near Roos. Matheson believes this refers to Tolkien's billet at Thirtle Bridge Army Camp. But I contend that Tolkien would never have described a location at which over a thousand men were stationed as a lonely house near Roos. 
<laughs> On balance, I believe he was based away from the camp and in a house not adjacent to other dwellings, but not too far from Roos. One possibility is a building on the outskirts of Holstrom, which has a few isolated buildings at that time as it does now. It is much smaller and more strung out than the comparably more tightly packed Roos. And I'm going to skip through Holsham. But what I'll do is, um, I'll, what I'm going to put this on my, on my blog, because um, there isn't time to go through it today. I'll just a few images of Holsham. Um, there's, there's Roos Church. It's the nearest place to walk across the fields. You can get to the mausoleum, which I'm going to mention, and by, by road. It's also the nearest, and Holsham starts here, so it's really strung out. And compare that with the tightly packed um, roofs that I showed you earlier on. There's a Holsham mausoleum. This, this was a Roman Catholic site, so I think Tolkien would have been interested. There's a Holsham house. And when I went round the corner, this is built into the side of Holsham house. Little alcove with the Virgin Mary. There's a very strong Roman Catholic uh, tradition, which I could, I'll work, go into now, but I'll we'll go in on my blog. Um, Roos didn't have a continuing Roman Catholic faith, according to the history books, but Holsham did. Right, this is Thurtle Bridge. That's the actual bridge at the moment. Probably, looking at the bricks, especially this, you know, with the 1950s, but that um, foundation stone, does, that was there um, before Tolkien was there. After the idyllic period in Roos, it is believed that Tolkien returned to Thurtle Bridge Camp, which is approximately one and a quarter miles southeast of Roos. On some detailed old maps, Thurtle Bridge is mapped, but no one lived there before World War I. It was simply a bridge over the Tunstall Drain on the road to Wittensee. However, for the duration of the First World War, a temporary camp was installed on the higher ground above Thurtle Bridge, catering for 1,500 men. That first picture, that's the first part, is the surviving officer's mess. It's been extended and made into a house. And then this is the old cookhouse. It's now become a corrugated barn, but it, that's the footprint of the old cookhouse that, would, that was servicing the camp at the time. Unlike um, the Staffordshire um, images, there's very few surviving um, images of, of the camp at Thurtle Bridge. But the picture that um, <coughs> David showed this morning of you know, Tolkien in uniform sat down yeah. and the estate told him it was taken in Wittensee, it would actually have been taken at Thurtle Bridge. And someone, a model maker has gone to um, the, the trouble of constructing um, a reproduction of what Thurtle Bridge Camp looked like. It, uh, it, took, it explained the work that they've gone into it. It was absolutely amazing. So that's the officer's mess. <coughs> and the cookhouse is right at the back there. And then it would extend four times as many of the, the, the um, huts going that way. Um, but he's had to just do a fraction of it. And that's the only surviving picture of, of the camp that is known. It's obviously a picture of the gentleman in the um, photograph that you can see. And um, David mentioned the <coughs> huts at Mordor. <coughs> but I'm also reminded of the huts at, um, around Bag End, <coughs> the Shire, in the scouring of the Shire. So I think that also um, there's a connection there as well, the shacks. I don't think that's the sort of architecture that Tolkien would have appreciated. Right, here is the road between Thetle Bridge is at the very top left hand corner. There's only one road to Withensea. There's the lighthouse, which is the most um, most significant feature of, of, of uh, Withensea. At the end of the mystery six week period mentioned earlier, Edith moved into lodgings in Withensea. We know she was installed there by the 12th of July. Edith's lodgings at 76 Queen Street, which is here, and she was the second bay window, are only about 200 yards away from Withens's only monolithic structure, the lighthouse, completed in 1894. That's how it looks today. 
I used to work in a bank opposite here and between customers stared bored out the window, not realising I was looking straight in to Edith's lodgings door. <laughs> Five years and I had no idea. <laughs> and there's the lighthouse. It's 127 feet high, that's 39 metres, and it's at least three times the height of any of the surrounding buildings. The lighthouse is a striking feature in what is an otherwise unremarkable town, made even more so by being painted brilliant white. The lighthouse is unusual um, as it's built well inland from the sea, and Edith's lodgings are slightly nearer to the lighthouse than the sea, so she's between the lighthouse and the sea. That's just to show you that how, how much larger than the um, surrounding houses they are, it is. And here is the lighthouse, and there's Edith's lodgings, and there's the sea. So it's well inland, usually the lighthouse is, is more or less along the sea, but erosion has always been a problem on the east coast. Today, the um, lighthouse is surrounded by domestic dwellings, but in 1917, the, the adjacent area was much less cluttered as this early postcard shows. So it's got houses all on that side, but there's big gaps on that, so now it's um, built up on either side of that main road. When the light was working, the beam could be seen for a radius of 17 miles, but even unlit as it is today, the lighthouse is a structure which can still be seen from the southern edge of Roos. The road leaving Roos undulates slightly, so in the hollows the lighthouse is lost to sight, but it comes back into view again as soon as one gains height. The lighthouse would have been visible to Tolkien from the camp as long as the sightlines weren't blocked by the temporary camp buildings. There's a view from above. You can see how far, how far back the lighthouse is. <coughs> and there, um, forget my car, right there. <laughs> there's the um, Mona house, the officer's mess. And there's a view of the lighthouse. Again, there's, there's the map again, showing you. So he would leave, if he wanted to visit Edith, leave that Thirtle Bridge, come along here, and you can, but you can see, uh, you can see the lighthouse from the camp, or you should have been able to. Shortly after the outbreak of um, the war, the Hull Daily Mail reported that Withersea Lighthouse had been in darkness for a fortnight. So when Tolkien was in Hulderness, three years later, the light would still have been doused for most of the time. There were exceptions though, and the light was permitted to glow again during World War II if a special convoy needed escorting through the hazardous shallows off the Yorkshire coast. The evidence is lacking for World War I, but the Withensee Museum assumes that the situation would have been almost identical during the earlier conflict. It's very difficult to check for sure because a lot of the Trinity House material uh, was lost in a fire, but it is worth chasing up to see if we can find out more of what happened during World War I. Now, although Tolkien explicitly states in his interview with Dennis, uh, how do you pronounce that, Geralt, that he did not think in symbols, when he caught sight of that brilliant white lighthouse from anywhere in Hilderness, surely he would have been reminded of Edith while she was lodging firmly at the lighthouse's foot. Indeed, it seems highly probable that even after Edith left Children, that this striking white structure would still remind Tolkien of his wife's former sojourn in the town. As I've shown here, there's only one direct route um, from Thirtle Bridge to Withensea when he wished to visit his wife or when he needed to catch a train to Hull for monthly medical examinations or visits to hospital, and that is the winding, undulating road now known as the B1242. Initially, only the summit of the White Tower of the Whittensea Lighthouse can be glimpsed, but uh, it costs, as you get nearer and nearer, it gets, it gets larger and larger. For over a mile after leaving the camp, there would hardly have been a single man-made structure between Thirtle Bridge and Whittensea, in what was, and still is, a completely rural landscape. However, 
one and a quarter miles southeast of Thurtle Bridge, on the edge of a small settlement called Waxholm. You see Waxholm there. Is a hill, and on the summit of which is a ruined mill, variously called Withensy Mill, Waxholm Mill, Outlaw Mill, Old Mill, and more simply, Black Mill. So that's what would have been at that corner. I'll just go back if I can. That's there, almost halfway between Thurtle Bridge and Widensea. What's this black mill? It last ground corn in 1892 and its sails were removed in 1904. In 1917, the black painted windmill was still at its full height of approximately 40 feet and was being used as a watchtower by the army. It can safely be assumed that on the summit some guns were mounted as a defence against low flying zeppelins. Only a couple of years ago, the family who owned the mill discovered a box of World War I ammunition in its foundations from its time on the front line. As the road from Thurtle Bridge approaches the mill, it dips into a deep depression, so the final ascent to the mill becomes quite steep, and the black mill on the hill would have loomed larger than it would if it approached it on the level. In 2015, the ruined mill, let's see if I've that's what's left now, is just um, a presence on a hazardous bend. But in 1917 and 1918, as a contemporary newspaper makes clear, the whole coastal road running from Easington, which is down in the very south, up to Skipsey, which is above Hornsey, was under military control. So there would have been a series of roadblocks at significant junctions, and one of the most prominent was at this point. There's a bit zoomed in a bit. Um, Waxholm had a few houses, you see. If they were fearing, it never happened, if they were fearing that gem, the gems might actually come, there would be a roadblock here. Um, and they found um, an article in the newspaper that local women from Waxholm complained about the barrier in the Waxholm Road because the warehouse in which they had to sign before c continuing on their way was over two feet above the ground. People were, you know, ladies didn't like to lift, let people see their legs. One Waxholm resident stated that she would remain at home forever rather than be subjected to manhandling over the stride <laughs> up, to the, up to the warehouse. So she, so she probably died back in Waxholm. <laughs> From the black mill, now let's just go back again. It's possible to see both the white spike of Withensea Lighthouse, but you can just see it there, over a mile away in a southeasterly direction, but also quite a different white tower, about one and a half miles away to the south, um, south, no, to the south. This is the brand new, when Tolkien was there, gleaming white water tower of Rimswell completed in 1916. As far as I'm aware, this bears no similarity whatsoever to any, to any tower in Tolkien's day. <laughs> Whether it was painted white um, during the war on, in World War I, it would be such an obvious target. <coughs> now, I'm not suggesting that any towers in East Yorkshire directly inspired those in The Lord of the Rings, but how more likely that these two specifically coloured towers of Widensea Lighthouse and the Black Mill in a relatively uncluttered wartime landscape are better candidates than two structures from an urban, cluttered landscape in Tolkien's peaceful childhood. <laughs> I don't know what I'm referring to there. <laughs> the, additionally, Tolkien encountered these two towers just as his fictional landscape was starting to coalesce in his imagination. I admit there aren't too many similarities between Winsey Lighthouse and Pippin's initial impression of the Tower of Atelion in Minas Tirith which he saw shimmering like a spike of pearl and silver, tall and fair and shapely, and its pinnacle glittered as if it were wrought of crystals, and white banners broke and fluttered from the battlements in the morning breeze. That's the uh, water tower a bit closer to. <laughs> That's a view from the Withensea Lighthouse, showing the um, uh, town laid below it. However, the later description, when Denethor retreats to his chamber, 
to consult the Palantir at the summit of the tower is faintly reminiscent of the function of a partially used lighthouse. Many who looked up thither at that time saw a pale light that gleamed and flickered from a narrow window from the narrow windows for a while and then flashed and went out. Withensee Lighthouse has the town of Withensee lying around it, but it is not the centre of the town as the Tower of Ecthelion is in the centre of Minas Tirith. In some of the early pictorial representations of the tower, talking sketches can look remarkably like lighthouses. One example is the rejected cover for the two towers. Well, this actually depicts Minas Morgul, which was originally the sister city of Minas Tirith, Minas Ithil, and it was originally constructed by the same regime, and it may well have had some design similarities to the White Tower of Minas Tirith. So does Wednesday Lighthouse have a sister lighthouse which Tolkien also saw. The nearest candidate is Spern Lighthouse, which is visible from Kinsey, which we know he visited when undergoing hospital treatment. However, the possible ramifications of Spern Lighthouse will be featured much later in this talk, if there's time. <laughs> and if not, um, I'll, I'll, will be one of the things I'll put on my blog. While Edith was still lodging beneath the shadow of the White Tower of Withensee Lighthouse, her husband had a recurrence of trench fever and he was sent to the first of the two houses of healing who would become acquainted with in East Yorkshire, Brooklyn's Officers Hospital on Cottenham Road in Hull. Oops, there's the view from of, of um, Spare Lighthouse from uh, Kilnsey. It's darker than the um, Withensee Lighthouse, obviously, but it's not um, purely black. That's the tower near Roos at Hillston. So we're going to Hull on the Brooklyn Officers Hospital. This 10 week stay was the first of two long stints, lasting in total around 22 weeks at this convalescent home, and his time spent there was extremely productive. In the first instance, he was able to spend long periods working on the building blocks of his emerging language, known at the time as Goldegreen. There have been many writers who have attempted to follow Tolkien in writing fa fantasy narratives, but none of them have matched his care in creating grammars and language. For Tolkien, language, oops, I've lost my words. language was the keyspring of the imaginative <coughs> process. The language, as he often attested, words or names came first and stories followed afterwards. In addition to the time spent on the foundation of his lexicons, vocabularies and grammars, Tolkien also wrote down for the first time the earliest versions of two stories which he continued to write, rework, and reimagine for almost the whole of his writing life the tale of Tenuvial and the tale of Turumbar. The central importance of Luthien Tenuvial is exemplified by his placing of the fictional name Luthien under his wife's name on their gravestone more than half a century later. Meanwhile, Christopher Tolkien carefully adapted and edited the various strands of the Turumbar narratives, written mainly in the 1950s in an attempt to create a co cohesive whole for what in effect became Tolkien's final published posthumous novel, The Children of Hurin, in 2009. So this is the back of Brooklyn's, it's now the Denison Centre, um, part of Hull University. Brooklyn's was was operated by Margaret Strickland Constable, Nee Packenham, who was actually the commandant, not the matron, as stated by some earlier researchers. That's the side. And this is the side where the hospital beds were, supp were supposed to have been stationed. There she is. That's several years before she went talking. Brooklyn's was only officially opened as a hospital for officers as late as the 31st of July, 1917, by Major General Sir Stanley von Dunop. <laughs> what was a German doing opening um, this <coughs> hospital? On completion, accommodation, accommodation was provided for only 17 patients. So there was only 17 um, officers when it was at the full capacity. And on the opening day, three were installed and they were joined by Tolkien only a fortnight later. So if, he'd have, if his trench fever had hit him three weeks before, he might never have gone to Brooklyn's, he might have been sent out of the area. The hospital enjoyed a good reputation amongst local officers. 
as an overhead comments which Strickland Constable proudly included in their diary implies. Head brother overhead two officers talking on a train. Um, what you want to do is arrange to have a good crash so as to get sent to Brooklands. Likewise, talking found the surroundings congenial and surviving ordnance survey maps from 1910, which this one is, show that the substantial grounds contained several mature trees. <coughs> and you can notice that the deciduous trees where the cedars next door had some conifers. Cosman Road itself, which is the road going on the top there, um, was a fairly quiet, leafy land thoroughfare. And on the other side of the road, so Tolkien was in here, and on the other side of the road were just open fields. Are there any similarities between the fictional houses of healing and Brooklyn's, which Tolkien found himself enduring for 22 weeks in total in 1917 and 1918? Well, Kingston upon Hull and Minas Tirith upon Anduin <laughs> are both described as cities, but the associated landscapes could hardly be more different. In 1917, as now, Hull is a city of the plain, barely rising above sea level, whilst Minas Tirith was carved into a spur of Mount Mindaluin and enjoyed the health benefits of mountainous airs. Minas Tirith was constructed from stone, indeed it was known as the Stone City. In contrast, there is very little local stone around Hull, and many of the substantial medieval buildings, including Holy Trinity Church, are largely um, constructed of brick. And then I, I was going to go into um, textual um, details from um, Minas Tirith to show similarities, and, and, but we haven't got time, so I'll, that would be something I'll put on the blog as well. As I mentioned, um, Strickland Constable's diaries for the time survive, and although she does not mention Tolkien by name, we do know that he was in Brooklands for the second long period um, when the Zeppelin raid of the 6th of August 1918 took place in Hull. She wasn't there, but she reports what the um, nurses say. She mentions that two majors with neurasthenia hid under their beds when the bombardment took place but the remainder, including Tolkien, were said to be quite calm. Although Tolkien shared some of his time at Brooklands with an officer friend, and he was able to produce some good work on his emerging mythology, it seems the diet he enjoyed there could hardly have been more, um, could have been more nutritious. On the 11th of October, 1918, exactly the same day that Tolkien left Brooklands for the final time, Colonel Easton, who was the local uh, big rig, wrote to the local newspaper asking for presents of game to be donated to the institution, which he pointed out was the only officer's hospital in Hull and the surrounding district. Now we're going to the other house of healing, which is at Kinsey. Almost exactly a year earlier than that appeared in the paper, Tolkien was discharged from Brooklands for the first time, and he returned to Thurtle Bridge. When trench fever or other illnesses returned over the winter of 1917 to 18, he was sent to Kinsey for treatment at the hospital at the Godwin Battery. This house of healing was very different from the other on the leafy um, edge of Hull. At that time, it was approximately 300 yards from the sea, and being winter, some of Tolkien's visits must have coincided with pounding seas. The hospital is not shown on this plan, but it was here. Tolkien, as far as his memory went back, could remember a terrible recurrent dream of a great wave towering up and coming ineluctably over the fields, over the trees and green fields. All the Tolkien's nightmare predated his internment in Kinsey Hospital. It was no doubt intensified by his proximity to what had until recently been called the German Ocean. The Godwin Battery Hospital is evident from contemporary aerial photographs. This was taken in 1917 or 18, and the hospital 
is there. This um, road still exists. It's now called locally Beacon Lane. It was called, it's officially called North Marsh Lane. The Godwin Battery Hospital um, is very close to North Marsh Lane, as I've said, and at the southern end of the lane, about 550 feet away from the hospital, was the Blue Bell, now this will be here, was the Blue Bell pub, which had very clear proof embedded in its signs of the destructive power of the sea. There's another um, plan. So the hospital was there, guns here, barracks, and the Blue Bell here. There's the Blue Bell, it's now called the Blue Bell, Bell Cafe, it's a visitor centre, the Oxford Wildlife Trust. There's the plaque, one of, that plaque was there when Tolkien was, this one is newer, and I'll just zoom in because you can't read that. So built in the year 1847, 534 yards from the sea. In 1994, 190 yards from the sea. So I've calculated that when Tolkien was there, it was probably 250 yards from the sea. As Tolkien made clear in his interview with Dennis Geralt, apologies, how we pronounce it, he was always historically minded, and he would no doubt have had examples of the destruction of the sea. The old tower of Kinsey Church was finally swallowed up by the sea in 1831, and earlier, an ornate medieval cross was removed inland to safety in 1818. This cross is thought to have uh, that commemorated the landing of Henry IV at Ravenspare in 1399, or the arrival of the return of the king, Edward IV, from exile in 1471. It's now been removed well inland. And this is the flooding that happened in 1906 at Easington. This, is, this should have been all land, and that's in that strange structure in the distance is Easington Beacon. So the pounding of the waves were the only sounds that Tolkien would have heard when he was hospitalised at Kilsey. The Godwin battery of which the hospital was a part included two 9.2 inch guns mounted 100 years apart and at either side of them were the battery observation posts which was still standing when this photograph was taken in 1964. So there, and there are the battery observation posts, there where the guns were mounted, and the hospital, let me just step back, I believe, would have been in that area, but it probably demolished. This is 1964, and you can obviously see that amid all the remains of Godwin Battery, people were kept putting caravans, so it was a holiday destination. But it's amazing what's happened since 1964. Those gun emplacements are now on the beach, and that's all that's left. And there was a sea wall in Tolkien's time, which um, can now only be seen at very low tide. So it can't even be seen at every low tide, only when the tide is very low. But that's where the high tide came to in Tolkien's time. So it's amazing in 100 years, the amount of destruction. The, the recurrent great wave dream continued to haunt Tolkien until he managed to exercise it from his system by writing the downfall of Numenor in the 1930s. In Hammond and Skull's The Lord of the Rings and Readers Companion, when Tolkien mentions the beacons of Gondor, which were lit to summon aid from Rohan, the authors quite rightly note that almost every English man woman and child would immediately think of the beacons lit in 1588 to warn of the Spanish Armada. The authors go on to mention earlier beacons in antiquity, but they fail to refer to Tolkien's personal association with the beacon during World War I. The Kinsey Beacon was originally erected in Napoleonic times and constructed of wood. This is an engraving drawing of one. But when Tolkien was in Hildness, it had been moved westwards inland from its original location on a hill. It was a sensible place to have um, a beacon. But it had to be moved because it had been lost to the sea. So the hill had gone. And 
Perhaps the rather unprepossessing beacon that was there when Tolkien was there. It was finally dismantled in World War II as it was thought to be a too obvious, ready identified landmark for enemy planes. When Tolkien was in the Humber garrison, he travelled to Dunstable to sit a signalling course exam in the second half of July 1917. And where Tolkien's duties as a signalling officer connected in any way with one of the most striking surviving remnants of the Great War in the area. In 1916, an acoustic sound mirror, that's what this is, was erected at Kinsey to listen out for approaching aircraft, which at that time it just meant Zeppelins. The sound was focused by the concave dish to the collector's head, which would have been at the top of this metal structure here still visible in modern photographs, and on which was mounted a rudimentary microphone. Wires from this led down into a trench in which an operator with headphones would listen for approaching aircraft and would provide an early warning. Actually, only four minutes. Some things do change. <laughs> <laughs> we will probably never know if Tolkien was one of those listeners, but even if he wasn't, when he was in the Kinsey area, he could not have failed to see this brutal, monumental structure. Incidentally, this 16 feet high piece of concrete remains the only listed building in Kilsey. <laughs> it tells you what the houses are like. <laughs> <laughs> when not hospitalised at the Godwin Battery, Tolkien lived for a time, presumably around this period, according to a note on a manuscript of Elf Alone, at Easington, because on the back of a manuscript it says at, um, at, at a farmhouse near Easington is where he spent time working on it. And in addition, one of the other manuscripts of what became the Song of Ariel includes a later note which says Easington 1917 to 18. So just one of the buildings that he would have passed that's in the centre of Easington. And this is what's called the Tower in Easington, which has changed very little since 1917. And that was owned by Robert Walker. He left diaries, and they've been examined, and he is known to have rented out some of his properties to army personnel. But it isn't known for certain if one of these was Tolkien. Unfortunately, it doesn't name, it doesn't name that. As a man steeped in history, Tolkien was almost certainly aware that at the time of the Doomsday Book, most of the land around Easington, indeed the whole of Holderness, which wasn't owned by the church, because of course the church would own large segments, was owned by, belonged to the Earl of Holderness, a certain Drogo. <laughs> it's rather surprising that Tolkien would have chosen, would choose Frodo's father's name from a hated Norman overlord. Of course, Tolkien's on record as blaming the Norman conquest for depriving England of many of its Anglo-Saxon native oral myths and legends before they could be written down. Whether Tolkien recalled this name when he was writing The Lord of the Rings and selecting a name for Frodo's father is an open question. However, Holness contains both North and South Frodinum, so there does appear to be at least a tenuous link between these two members of the Baggins family in the landscape of the East Riding. Now, I was going to go on talk about spare points. There's there's a lighthouse. But what I will say, it had a white, the white light, normal, but um, 60 feet up also shone out a red light. But I'll go into more details of that um, on my blog in the lengthier version. One thing worth mentioning is that whenever a claim is made um, for two towers which may have influenced Tolkien, they always stop at two. At two. The childhood Edgbaston ones and the recent claim on Channel 5 about Colchester Castle and the White Tower of the Tower of London are examples which immediately spring to mind. However, Tolkien's letters show even he was unsure just which two towers the title referred to, and there are many more than two mentioned during the course of the Lord of the Rings. Orthanc, Baradur, Minas Tirith, Kirith Ungol, two towers of the teeth at the Black Gate, and of course, the white elven towers to the west of the Shire. 
Similarly, there are more than two towers Tolkien will have seen during his period in the relatively open landscape of East Yorkshire. We know he had to pass the Black Mill at Waxholm, and he couldn't ignore the spire of Whittensea Lighthouse. He must have seen Spare Lighthouse and Rimswell's Water Tower, and even the hospital at Godwin Battery had two observation towers on either side of it. But there is another close to Roos, the Admiral Stores Tower, which I did include earlier on. This is the original Spare Lighthouse, which had gone by Tolkien's time shored up. It was unsafe at the time, so it had to be replaced. Got a round compound there with houses, which you could see. Let me just go back a bit. Buildings facing out. This, can, you, can you see the ghost of the tower? The black tower that was, that was in the middle of there. And there were some similarities which I'll go, to, go into um, on my blog. Michael. Could you go back to that slide, please? Which one? Of the houses. The, uh, the round? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. no, sorry, the rules. Oh, it's gone back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. I don't know mm -hmm. what you are. Click the sign, From From Kurt's slide. Press the round button. I just wondered, how, how old is, was that photograph? Um, I can check, but I think it was um, late um, late Victorian period. What, what, can you remember what slide it, you were on? It was very near the end. Oh, just go through that. Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> yeah. There must be a quick one there. <laughs> Get close. Taking the Second World War, so that was still that was still there then. Um, these, these, these have all been demolished now. There's none of none of that's there anymore. What about the wall? Does the wall still exist? No, unfortunately, not at all. But there are subterranean passages under there, even though that's on sand. And there are subterranean passages which I only found out about fairly recently. But that's something I'm going to go into in the longer version. Spare Point is the, at the southernmost extremity of East Yorkshire. And arriving there marks the end of this journey, following Tolkien's physical association with the area. Although Tolkien endured, put in inverted commas, two holidays from the University of Leeds in the 1920s at the more northerly resort of Farley, they are only known that they are only known further visits to the Yorkshire coast. I hope I've shown that the 18 months Tolkien spent, spent in Holderness in the late, latter stages of World War I and the early period of his marriage continued to reverberate in his imaginative fiction in the ensuing decades. If not, I trust I have made this neglected corner of Yorkshire a little better known to talking enthusiasts than it was before. That's it.